Um, so welcome everyone. I'm Kerry Keene, Assistant Director and Research Scientist at the Energy Institute. Welcome to the UT uh, Austin Energy Symposium for October 13th. Uh, before I introduce the speaker for today, I will just point out the speaker for next week, who is Vince or Vincent Kaminsky, who's a professor of practice of energy management at the School of Business at Rice University. And he's gonna talk about the impact of the global pandemic on the energy industry. So how do we think about things that have happened and changed a lot since uh, effectively March this year due to COVID-19. So that is next week. And then the week following that uh, is a conversation with myself with Damon Drummer of New Consensus, who is a group is somewhat known for thinking about the Green New Deal and promoting that idea. Um, we'll talk about the role of the federal government and public investment in the energy system and concepts within the Green New Deal. Today, uh, we have our own uh, here at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, Zoltan Nagy. He's going to give a talk titled Designing Intelligent Environments Using Reinforcement Learning. So, uh, so he's got a lot of buzzwords here in his uh, background and his abstract. So this is gonna be great for people that wanna learn things about demand response, building management, artificial intelligence, uh, reinforcement learning, uh, even robotics and his background in robotics. So uh, Zoltan is an assistant professor here in the Department of Civil, Architectural and Environmental Engineering. And he's directing the Intelligent Environments Laboratory since 2016. So we're gonna learn about that. Um, and as it says here in his background, he's a roboticist turned building engineer. So how do we think about that blend? And he's working on all kinds of uh, even non-engineering multidisciplinary research. So we might hear about that as well but we're going to hear about his work as it relates to um, zero emission buildings, uh, renewable energy systems, and how do we use these kinds of artificial intelligence algorithms to think about smart buildings and smart environments. So with that said, I'm now going to stop sharing and let Zoltan take over. And as a reminder to everyone, please enter your questions in the Q&A feature of the webinar at any time as we go along. And if there are clarifying questions that you enter, we will attempt to uh, ask them of Zoltan or he might look at them as we go forward. Uh, but we'll certainly have questions at the end. So with that said, uh, Zoltan, go ahead. Thank you, Kerry. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for inviting me to speak here. I look forward to it. And as, as Kerry said, if you at any moment Need a clarification? Feel free to pop a question in the in the Q and A, um, and then I'll try to stop it. I'll see the Q and A in front of me, um, and I, and if you know, I'd, I'd rather have a conversation than going through my slides um, if there are other topics um, that are of interest or that come up during the talk. So I'm very happy to discuss. Okay, so I will talk about intelligent environments uh, and designing them using reinforcement learning. Um, just one slide on my background as Corey started, uh, Carrie started talking about it. And here is the, the transition project, so to speak, from the robots to the buildings. Uh, I spent uh, four or five years as a postdoc in the architecture school uh, where we worked on this, this facade that was supposed to be really awesome and really, you know, robotically driven um, and, and adjusting itself to, to all kinds of different problems, you know, inside and outside and modulating the light and the energy into the building. And, and it was it was kind of, um, you know, tough. And then we developed new actuators, but really got what me what got me thinking and, and hooked in that problem. And we almost didn't even get there because it's what a four year uh, project took a long time. But we really did the actual problem that I was very interested in to work on is like, how do you tell these things what to do? And you know, these are individually addressable, so like little mirrors basically. And so there's like 25 of those in that image or actually more like 30 in that image here at the bottom. Um, and so, and that's just one window in that building. So if you scale that up, you have hundreds of those. And so it became very clear that, you know, traditional algorithms were a little tricky to apply here. The people that use control systems um, were, were you know, trying to predict what you have to do and then provide very clear commands. And it was just clear that that's not going to work because, you know, for one, this is complicated, but then the other one is you, you put that onto another building, that building has its own thing, its own complicated environment, and it, you have to start all over again. And so from the very beginning, I was trying to find out uh, how can we deal with that? And so 
today I'm going to tell you a story a little bit of it, several projects that kind of like link together of how we get to that idea of how we can provide somewhat intelligence to the built environment, but not in a sense that we overdo it, but more in, in an emergent, uh, in emergent uh, intelligence sense. And of course, before, um, you know, I'm not doing this alone. This is my group. Um, this is a picture from last fall before COVID. I don't know what we'll do this year for a group picture, but um, this is what we had last fall. Um, you know, several PhD students, master's students, lots of undergrads interested in this topic from uh, all over there are uh, engineering school, civil, mechanical, electrical, computer science as well, architects, architectural engineers, uh, you know, working on this topic from different angles, um, environmental engineers, I missed, I should add here. Um, and so, you know, trying to like working towards this idea of, you know, what what is really uh, this emergent intelligence in the building. And if you put this down, uh, this is my most uh, worthy slide for the day, what we do in a nutshell, you know, working on science, engineering, education towards intelligent, human responsive infrastructure um, by doing cool stuff. So innovative applications is the, the code for cool stuff. But really in a nutshell, this is the question that we're trying to answer. Like what is a smart building? And, you know, there is, I don't know how many listening and probably each of you have a different idea what it is. And so the cool thing is we get to define what it should be in our case. Um, and so that, that's the story of today's talk, what we think smart building or a smart city should be, you know, before other people decide, define it for us. So, you know, we do a lot of things in the lab. Um, the, like I said, we're talking about emergent behaviors. It has a lot to do with machine learning applications, um, you know, and, and so we, we, we do have theoretical and app applied work in all branches of um, machine learning. So supervised learning, the classic, you know, here's input output, we try to match uh, these days with deep, deep learning, deep neural networks. Unsupervised learning is it's more about pattern. Can we find, um, you know, similarities in energy data, um, similarities in energy use data, water use data, occupancy data, things like that. We do a lot on our campus. Uh, we can talk about that later if you want. Um, here at the bottom, I lumped together a whole bunch of projects that are not related to ML directly, but they're supportive, you know, dealing with IoT systems um, that we, we, we just deployed a, a set of uh, sensors, like 40, 50 of those, where we measured air quality and sleep quality with Fitbits, and we asked people about how they slept, and now all this data is coming back, and so we're trying to understand the patterns um, and how we can build a better environment that provides, uh, you know, a more conducive environment for, for sleep quality. And, and, you know, it's quite fascinating to put all these bits and pieces together. And then, you know, overall also just data analytics, data analysis, large building energy, um, urban energy analytics, um, things like that, that we're, we're moving forward. Today's talk is about reinforcement learning. In particular, um, again, we have lots of work in that area. We, we worked on zones, you know, how can we find out uh, or work towards adaptive environments that could learn uh, from the occupants how how they feel and what temperatures they prefer, what lighting they prefer. Um, we ha we have a talk like that on our YouTube channel from a recent defense. If you're interested, today's talk will focus on uh, the the urbanist scale, and so more about you know smart city uh, and demand response in smart cities, and so we'll talk about that. Let's move forward. Um, like. Like Kerry said, I put all the buzzwords in the abstract. So one of the buzzwords that you hear everywhere today, reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning. And I will not go into like the technicalities of how it works. Um, but I will say the cool thing about it is that the really exciting thing is that, you know, you, you create, it's based on a system of interaction. And so you have um, the, the thing that you're trying to, that, that tries to make decisions. So this is just a fancy word for basically making decisions on this uncertainty. And so the agent that's trying to make decisions here, you know, enters into dialogue with the environment. It, it you know, it perceives stuff from it, perceives states, so sensor readings, uh, forecasts, whatnot. Um, and, and based on those, it will do a certain actions. And, you know, depending on how those actions go, it will you know, receive an award or a punishment from the environment. So we as engineers, we set up the system and we kind of like 
engineer this reward uh, in a way that we want to push the system to learn a behavior that maximizes its reward over time. There's many, many ways to do it. And, you know, we won't go into detail. If you're interested in the most cool application, um, you know, the DeepMind, Alpha, uh, DeepMind of, of Google, uh, there is a, a, video, a, a movie on Netflix of um, how the, the, the algorithm AlphaGo beat uh, one of the best human players in Go, which was supposed to be, you know, a very intuitive game. Uh, and so really the, the, the crown achievement, so to speak, of AI is to, to solve a problem and beat the human uh, at the game that requires a high level of intuition rather than, uh, you know, brute force computing like it would be with chess. And so the idea is that with this kind of setup, if it's done correctly, you can come up with really, really good solutions because uh, essentially it's an optimization problem. But you can get a, come up with really, really good solutions over time uh, that are uh, close to optimal, but without having to set it up in a complicated way. And so that's the adaptive and, and sort of like uh, emergent feature. And, you know, in, in, in a nutshell, um, if you want to go on the other end, so put it in very poetically, it's a trial and error approach. You do something, the agent does something, it tries it out, it gets some feedback. It will not do well for a while. Uh, it will fail and then it will improve over time and, and fail better, uh, as, as Sam Beckett put it, um, and to learn it. And to, you know, put another quote, uh, the way you think about this as you, as you contrast it with the more classic machine learning approaches, you know, um, of supervised and unsupervised methods is in here, you don't tell or don't program the computer what to do, or you don't train the computer on the answers that you want it to produce but you try to set it up in a way that it can learn to find those answers on its own. So here, Alan Turing, the father of you know, AI in the 50s already, this idea of putting it up and, and uh, setting it up in a way to simulate a child's mind that can you know, learn from the environment and, and understand it and improve um, its interaction with it. And so for many, we're, we're getting close towards this idea of you know, general and artificial intelligence. Um, and, and this is mostly not because the ideas are new. Everything that the concepts that I'm talking about today has been known for you know, at least 30 years. Uh, but the computing power um, that we have today allows us to, ch to you know, churn a lot of data and to actually produce results that are useful uh, down the road. So that's kind of like the big hope these days. Um, that we have much like the you know neural networks a couple of years ago and the image processing capabilities increased um, and, and improved and so you have all these cool applications i mean you can open your iphone now with uh, by looking at it which is pretty awesome but think about that 20 years ago it would have not been possible just because of the computing power okay so here's an example that that predates my ut time so this is from my postdoc time where where i was like okay so there is this this you know reinforcement learning not many people do it um there was this building where the engineers have, have so they, they you know um did a retrofit on it, a deep retrofit towards zero emission so they did you know lots of insulation this is in zurich so they did lots of insulation uh, they did, there, it's a solar thermal uh, collector here at the top. There is a geothermal borehole here. Um, and then, so the, basically the heating comes from the ground. It's pumped to uh, every, every room or every flat. These are apartments on every floor. Um, and then it's supported with the solar collectors for, for the heating. And in the summer, uh, when you have a lot of solar and you don't need the heating, the solar collectors can regenerate uh, the earth and so to avoid you know depletion of the of the layers and so you know this was a big project several phd students worked on it it's a real project that people live in this building um and and so we were sitting there this was the institute next door and i was like well you've got all this thing so they had this model going you know this was yeah collaboration with siemens who were doing the control um and so i was like well you have all of this let's just try to do you know, this very basic RL approach um, to control the mass flows in the system and try to improve, you know, the efficiency of your system. And so the way you picture it, and again, we don't go too much into detail, but there are three thermal loops in the system, right? One is um, here are the solar panels that extract the heat from the sun that goes on the panels. Those are coupled with the major, basically the major, um, major loop here that is either going to the space heating loop 
over here or going back to the ground. So that's basically the transport that goes through the building and it's connected to the ground. And it, it either pulls heat from the ground out and moves it to the building here, or it lets you recharge uh, the ground from the solar panels. And so again, you see here the rewards and we worked on these a little bit, setting them up. And the idea was to come up with the mass flows in each of these um, um, loops in order to you know, provide enough uh, space heating. So that was kind of like the goal, not to, uh, to, to, to match the demand there, but then not to do that in a way that we had to figure out, well, if the temperature is this much, if the solar radiation is this much, then we should do this, but more like, well, let's try it and then improve it over time on its own and see how long it would take it. And so here are the results. Um, you can you can neglect, neglect what's on the right hand side, but so so you have four curves here, right? You see the RBC, which is basically the reference. That's essentially that's what's been done in the building, rule based control, um, what the engineers set. So we have that as a reference, and then you have three uh, neural network architectures. So that's the only difference between the three colors. But we use just you know bigger, larger, smaller, and so on, just to see if there's a difference. In sensitivity. And so you can see, you know, this is year one with, with real simulate with real data. So it's real weather data simulated on the system. Um, and so we see, um, you know, usually the, 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 the output is here for the, for the RBC and, and then there are a couple of bad decisions at the end here for the thermal output of the system uh, made it go down at the end of the year, which is a little suboptimal. But then you look at the next year. And so year two, year three and year four, you consistently start outperforming um, the rule-based controller. And so, you know, frankly, every year, any of these, so in the, from a sensitivity standpoint, each of them is better as the rule-based controller, almost every year, you know, 10% better. And this is by us just giving it things like, here's the temperature, here is the, you know, the solar radiation, here is the demand, and what have you do, what can you do? And, you know, that was pretty cool because 10% essentially for free improvement of the energy, the, um, uh, the efficiency or the output of your system. And what was really f funny, uh, the PhD student, you know, working on this problem and setting up the optimization and figuring out for every hour, what's the optimal step. I uh, found the same 10, 10, 12% improvement. Uh, over time with a very complicated MPC. He had to have a whole computer for just running the simulation. And we run this in MATLAB, uh, pretty straightforward. So, you know, that was a big aha moment. I was like, okay, there is something here. And at that time, you know, there was not so many people working on this. Um, and so it seemed like an area that, that, you know, could be filled. So we started pushing more. So when I came here, um, 2016, and so we started to look at this a little more generally and also a little bit more scaled up. So the, the problem we're looking now um, to switch up and from now on, we will be looking at this. We'll, we'll, we're trying to understand the overall question here on the left-hand side, right? Can we learn, well, can we learn to heat and to cool buildings um, without knowing anything? So that's, that's kind of like stays the same here on the left-hand side. And the systems we're trying to do or look at it is, or use, you know, is, is a heat pump that will, will an air to air heat pump usually, uh, some storage, and it could be hot storage for, 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 for warm, uh, for heating or chilled water for, for cooling. And then a building that we want to satisfy this, this for. And so we did a lot of several steps. And then the next step in this was, you know, to, to link things up a little bit with a more uh, regular sort of like uh, AI tool or that people have been using. So that's why you see here the TensorFlow library, which is set up so that people, you know, for using it with, with RL and, and doing the neural networks and Keras helped us a little bit this interface to do, do this interface. And then on the other side, we started working with Citizen, which is an urban scale simulator. Um, because that will, like I said, we try to scale this up to city level, right? So we're trying to get to multiple buildings, 10, 20, 100 kind of buildings and create some kind of like a microgrid environment where we can start thinking about sharing information, sharing energy um, and so on. And then in between there was a, again, our controller that we coded up and, and you know, tried to understand. 
So this was a paper in between. This was a lot of work, uh, a lot of like, hard, like tedious, small work uh, because of this, you know, all these systems had to communicate with each other and it was a little, you know, frightening to do, quite frankly, and not really useful. However, we learned a few things um, and, and, you know, without showing you graphs, just to, just to recap. So the first thing we learned is that, you know, we repeated and we, we confirmed the previous findings that I showed you that we can indeed improve without knowing stuff, without knowing anything about the building. We can even do, um, uh, and, and we, we started to see that, you know, the, the biggest improvements you get is when you get more and more complex systems. So in this chart here, as it shows, you know, you have a heat pump, you have a storage and you have a building and you decide whether you use the heat pump to, you know, increase your storage or you use the storage to address the building, you know, in case it's, it's too expensive, for example. But what if you start to put, you know, solar panels on the roof here then all of a sudden you can also decide or, or your electricity for the heat pump can come from the solar panels or it can come from the grid, right? And so now it becomes a question of, well, it, when do you get the electricity? When do you satisfy the load? And so it becomes a lot more complicated or not complicated, but complex. And so again, if you write this down as an optimization problem, it becomes, you know, many like variables, many constraints to satisfy. If you write it down as RL, it, it's straightforward. And also what we see is that we improve a lot more compared to the RBC uh, when the system becomes more complicated. So that's a big aha moment because now you're thinking again, you know, 20 buildings. You try to coordinate 20 buildings, uh, extremely complex, especially if they start to have all these things like, you know, air to air heat pump, storage, uh, maybe distributed systems. And so that's another motivation to go further because it seems that complexity favors uh, complexity in the systems, which will be coming as we you know, add EVs to our, our setup, batteries. Um, this will be an ongoing problem. And, and so that, that's you know, a second aha moment, so to speak, that, that we move to the right direction. And then the, the third one here was, you know, if things change, these things will just adapt. So if you improve your building, you add a new HVAC, you increase your heat pump efficiency, you exchange your windows, you do a retrofit, anything, the old controller will not improve. The new one or the, this one, the RLC, will basically adapt to it and improve over time again. And so if you're interested in those details, you know, this is the paper. Um, email me, I, I'm happy to send it for you, but I didn't want to go into too much detail. Um, just highlight these these key points from those papers. And that, that's pretty cool. And then we started to think, okay, and so, you know, we're talking all about demand response. We're talking about smart cities. We're talking about distributed generation. And so, and not only that, but remember, it's the built environment. So it's not like the whole thing, like think of Austin, right? Not every single building will just transform immediately into whatever you want it to be it's going to be a process right so we literally need something that can adapt over time and pull out this um uh you know the most of the systems that are are embedded and so you know over time things change more and more systems come online more and more evs come online people start to get pv people start to get home batteries uh, maybe storage systems geothermal who knows distributed systems distributed cooling um you know things like that and so we need something that will adapt uh, over time. And so this is the kind of problem that we're, we've been always trying to set up to study. And so finally we arrived to this point. Um, and so I'll, I'll tell you where we get to that. So we, we did a review um, where, we, where we started to understand like what is out there, right? We, and you know, like I said, we started it here in 2016. You saw the first work I did, you know, started somewhere here, 2012, 2013, and there was really nothing uh, before that. And so these papers that came out in 13, 14, 15, a lot of it is electric vehicles, the orange stuff. A lot of it is also um, electric storage, distributed generation, the gray stuff, and then still a fair amount of HVAC, and then a tiny bit of smart appliances, which, which is probably not going to do much. Um, but so the, the problem was, if you're trying to do, or when we tried to do this, is we were looking for, you know, is there something out there that's really able to solve this complicated problem? 
And so what we saw is that everybody's kind of like cooking their own soup a little bit and which makes it really hard. And on the right hand side, you see that kind of like, oh, people do, you know, prices that are depending on your demand, prices that are independent of the demand, multiple agents, individual agents. So individual agents that know everything or multiple agents that kind of interact. So it's really hard to start comparing algorithms when you start, when you don't have reference points and everybody's just, you know, making up stuff basically like that it's it's kind of like a, a an exploratory phase in this science or engineering that everybody's just putting out cool results and but but there's no consensus of where this whole thing is going so we tried to to push that a little bit um you know and also investigate where are the where are the the the, the missing points and so in this sweet spot, like, you know, we, we're interested in, you know, RES integrations or renewable energy systems integration, demand dependent price, because that's the only thing you need, or that is the thing you need for things like demand response, you push it to the limit, non-stationary transition probabilities, which means your things can change over time, your systems change, like you add, you add HVAC system, you upgrade your buildings, new buildings come online, so you need that. And then multiple agents, because you don't really want to rely on one single thing, knowing everything that that will not work because it will be brittle. And so if at the intersection of those, this is a fourfold Venn diagram, you see a lot of emptiness. Not many people do that. It's a very big empty spot, but it's very, very important and complicated problem. There's more empty spots down here, but this is the one that we're interested in. And so, you know, so we just built it. So we, we were like, okay, well, let's build a simulator that takes care of the building side. So we don't need to worry about that. And it stays the same for everyone. And then let's provide it in an interface so that we can work on the algorithms. And so that's essentially what we did when we, when we built CityLearn over the last, let's say two years, um, we, we said, okay, here are the buildings. Here's a set of buildings. We put it into this, what's called open AI gym environment, which is, uh, a standard way, a standard, standard environment for RL research. And so this, this standardizes it, right? And so that allows everybody working on this and similar issues or on RL algorithms to test their algorithms on the same set of problems. You can go to this website, you can check it out um, and you can download it, it's free open source. Um, and so we keep working on that, trying to build a community on that. And so I'm going to show you a few things, okay? Um, so essentially, again, what is it? What does it contain? It has, you know, the buildings. And the buildings can have solar panels. Uh, they may or may not have chilled water storage and domestic hot water for for hot water storage for heating. Uh, they have the air to air heat pumps, and there is a connection to the power grid. It's in this gym environment, which means you're abstracting out the systems and you only focus on the control. Uh, and so by doing that, you can, you can um, not worry about the building side and everybody is doing the same buildings. And that's kind of like key because you can change a lot by changing your demand side. You can also work and compare algorithms that are centralized, which means you know one agent knows everything or decentralized, which means there is no, like, nobody knows nothing so my neighbor doesn't know what i'm doing we're kind of doing our own thing and then you know whatever happens happens and then there's everything in between right so i know a little bit i tell my neighbor what i do and my neighbor tells me what he's doing we make a plan and things like that so everything in between and all of that is possible now to do and then the, the, the problem itself that we're addressing is energy storage control uh, you see we're missing here batteries, electric batteries and EV vehicles, um, EV uh, cars, and, and that's currently under development and will be added uh, relatively soon, hopefully. Um, again, the objective is to create this plug and play controller um, to work on district scale so you can add many, many buildings and so you can understand the output of these algorithms on a district scale. And that allows you to do you know, things like load shaping, which is pretty cool. Uh, because that's what you want, um, you know, as an operator to see, well, how are my building is going to perform over time and how can we impact that? So here's an experiment. Uh, we did nine buildings. Um, there is um, these five here, four at the bottom, and then this one is multifamily. Uh, and then here's, a, um, I think that's a um, fast food, the strip mall. Um, this is an office and then a box store. 
um, just to, to create sort of like, you know, a typical environment. I don't know if it's typical. What you have is an almost equal um, load between uh, residential and non-residential. Uh, so that's kind of like how the, the, the mix is set up. And then some of the buildings have PV and some have non -PV, no PV. And so, you know, some details again, um, you have this hot, hot water storage, the air to water heat pumps, and then four of the buildings had PV. Um, there's the states that I mentioned before, you know, some of the things that go in, what, what day are we are, what hour of the day we are, uh, what kind of environment are we in, in terms of sensor readings, temperature, humidity, irradiation, a little bit of a forecast on the solar radiation. This example I will show you is a hot and humid climate. I think it's uh, New Orleans, um, but it's very similar to here. And then we have, you know, some buildings have solar PV, so use it as a state. And then what we want is the, you know, the state of the charge of uh, the domestic hot water and the chilled water. And so those are that goes in. And then your, your actions, what the agent can do is basically say, well, I want to increase the state of charge. So I use my heat pumps to add more chilled water, generate more heat chilled water, <clears throat> or decrease uh, the, the state of charge, which would mean um, use the storage um, to satisfy my demand. You see here <clears throat> on the right-hand side, you see you can use the heat pumps to charge, you can use the storage to charge, or you can use this part to load, <clears throat> sorry, um, to, to address the load in the building. <clears throat> Very important, again, no explicit model in the development. So we just give it the sensor readings um, and then the, the actions it can take. We initialize randomly. This is important because it means that we can initialize every single building in the same way. We don't have to do anything special because the building is a residential versus a non-residential building, for example. And in this example that I'm showing, there will be no exchange of information uh, between the buildings. What we'll do, and this is the only equation uh, that I'll show you, is that the reward that each agent get is a combined reward of the electricity that you're using, the net demand of the building from the grid, and the whole demand, so the net electric demand of that microgrid. So both go into this um, together. So if they manage to orient themselves, to arrange themselves in a way that they use less energy, it's more favorable to them but they don't know what the neighbors are doing. So that's kind of like set up as the most naive approach to some extent. So here's what the output of that, um, here's the reference. So if there is no control, this is essentially the demand of, uh, of this microgrid over you know, the fall on the left, the summer in the, in the middle and the, and the winter on the right. You see the median daily profile and then the, the, the I think 90th percentile and the 25, 75 percentile of daily profile. So what you would expect, right? No load in the winter, basically high peak in the summer, in the afternoon, uh, and then, uh, you know, <clears throat> somewhere in between for the, for the shoulder season. Um, so if you do a rule-based control, which is, you know, when you charge and discharge the seat pumps and you do it really aggressively and optimize it, and we did this with a grid search. So basically run through almost every option you would have. What you do is, uh, or what happens is, right? You, you can reduce your loads quite a bit, but you shift the peaks a little bit to off times. Um, this is because you try to generate um, electricity or, or use the electricity when it's cheaper at night um, and, and things like that. Or it's off the peak, um, it, it's easier. So that's, that's usually what you would expect or at least in something like that, if you know somebody would optimize their system. But you can do quite a lot of savings, right? Now, if you do it with an automated system, <clears throat> it actually gets a lot, interest, a lot more interesting. So remember, we don't really know what these buildings are doing, or we don't tell them what they do. But if you look at the outcome on the summer, because that's really the one that's interesting, it's almost as if it's a flat curve, um, almost a constant demand uh, across these buildings. And that's really cool because that means that, you know, you can, you, you don't have variation. So it's rather predictable uh, that you can expand. So you can flatten the curve. You see, you don't really generate new peaks. Um, you, you get these bumps uh, along the way, but, but they're far from the bumps that you get uh, from, the, from this one. You also don't get a duck curve. 
um, that you usually have with you know lots of renewables that you, you you satisfy the loads here and then you have problems with the ramping. So this is you know this is pretty cool. Of course, it's a microgrid and not every building has uh, the same setup. Some have you know solar and some have not. And so what you see is the aggregate. So here you see the RL the, the RL approach. The, these are the orange ones versus the no control uh, approach. And, and so you see that some buildings manage to do quite well. Uh, you know, these that have PV are able to shift the loads or reduce their loads. And then those that don't or have different load profiles like the residentials, they still maintain their peaks um, at, at peak hour uh, because they can't reduce them as easily. Um, and so the, the message is that when you look at things from a, a microgrid perspective or a combined perspective, um, you can create optimal sort of like configurations. And this is this was not put to, as an optimization problem how many PVs we need. This just happened to work because the system's adapted. But, but it also means that not every building will need PV. You just need sufficient amount to put an impact on the grid. And same with the storage. Not every building would need storage. You just need a sufficient amount to be able to shift the loads at the time when you most need it. And you know this this kind of shift is is quite quite impactful. I mean, it's it's almost half the load at the summer peak, which is pretty big. Um, if you can do it sustained over longer periods of time. Um, so, so that's kind of like it to wrap it up. And so, so you know, again to summarize it, why I like these things, you know, model free, meaning you don't need to develop models cheap. You can put them on many many buildings, computationally cheap, of course, not intellectually. Um, it's scalable because you don't, because you can initialize randomly. Um, so you can scale them up across many buildings. Um, adaptive, um, you know, you start somewhere and, and you, can, um, uh, you can end up with a good, almost optimal configuration. You can learn from past data. So if you have data, you don't start from scratch. Um, if you do start from scratch, this is a question I always get. If you start from scratch, um, there is a period of exploration where the system theoretically would do bad things that you don't want. However, you can always start with what you have, the rule-based controller, that's not going away, and then transition smoothly when you're, and then learn from that data and then transition when you're more confident. And then it, it's obviously better than the RBC, you're outperforming over time easily um, uh, the systems. So a few things, um, you know, we, we, we created City Learn and last year we started a challenge. Um, so there's a question, looks like Aurel is very powerful and it, does it have any disadvantages? Yes, of course. Um, as with anything, I will focus on the good things here. Um, there is the biggest disadvantage probably, or there's two, especially when you're doing, uh, you know, the one said that we show here, which is model free. So when it's model free, it's, uh, different, difficult to interpret because you have neural networks in there that do something. And so, you know, try to give that to someone uh, like a building manager and, and, and saying, oh, well, the algorithm is going to do stuff and it's going to be better. It's hard to convince. Uh, and it's, I, and I would agree, like, I don't want something like that in my building. Um, and so, and so, so that's one thing. So how we how we make that you know understandable uh, forward. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, you know the more complicated your systems get, the longer the learning period might be, and so the time is an issue. How quickly do you want this to actually converge somewhere? Currently, our simulations show somewhere you know half a year to a year, depending on what you're doing. Um, and then uh, the the last thing was. Um, in the first part, which is called exploration, when you put this on and you initialize randomly, um, you will take decisions that are really bad and it can cause detrimental you know, effects on the system, which means they can you know, break down or, or you know, things like that. And so that is the drawback because in order to adapt to or find good solutions, you need to explore your space, right? And so those two things, exploring the space robustly or you know, in a, in a way that does not harm your system is a, a big challenge right now for, for the community um, to do. And so there are tricks to do it, of course. Um, like one thing, the, the, the most naive one that I mentioned, you start with an RBC, you learn from the data. And when you're happy what, with what you learn, you, you move over uh, to your RL. And then that's, that's one, one thing you can do. 
Um, hopefully that answered the question. Um, Eric Jones, I believe the agent in these models are the building owners. What if an energy provider wanted to control load, like with demand response, would the algorithm adapt? So this is a very cool question. Um, and, um, and so um, you can uh, remote control the buildings um, and people work on that. And those are usually, uh, I think on the smart grid side, um, our setup is set up in a way that the building loads are always satisfied. And so we're, we don't control the people's thermostats in this case. Uh, we are working towards do, being able to do that. And so then it becomes a really cool, like, you know, multi-agent system where, you know, where you create a negotiation essentially between uh, the, the agent of the grid and the agent in the house and then see what happens. Um, and the, the new IPS, I think the, the, the ML conference has, I think a challenge on that, on the smart grid side, um, trying to do demand response uh, and thermostat control. Um, there is a colleague in, in Boulder, um, Kiri Baker, um, who does stuff like that. Interestingly, now that I mentioned her name, they will actually do something like this on the UT campus. So there is a project, a DOE project with Kiri and Attila Novoselic and um, Wang Deju also from Boulder and Attila Novoselic from UT um, that will try to do some smart algorithms on a campus because as you know, that is kind of like a district cooling, a kind of like a city and power net. So we'll find out soon enough. Um, what is the typical number of episodes that you recommend for training deep uh, learning? Uh, that is, uh, I'll give you a lawyer answer, it depends. Um, that depends on the problem. It depends on your goal. Uh, it depends on you know, how close you want to be to convergence. There is no such thing as a typical number for training unless you know the problem. Um, so again, we, what we did, we, we in this cases, so city learn the examples run for a year at least before we can say, okay, they actually did something in a year with, um, with uh, uh, hourly resolution. And again, that's, you know, try to, to speed that up so you don't have to train every hour, but maybe every month or every two weeks, things like that to, to make it faster. Um, so hopefully that answers that question, thank you. And then the next one, um, what motivates labeling this as model free? It seems as though you're rather starting with a poorly trained model that gets better over time. I'm not familiar with RL, so I may not be understood correctly. Um, no, no, no need to apologize. So. Um, the, the model three approach really is, is um, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't know, it's my pet peeve. So I want to see how far you can push these algorithms by starting at basically zero and no knowledge. Um, there is many, many folks out there, researchers who do things like something in between. So, you know, to start a, a simple model and try to learn it and train it over time um, and, and, and use that with RL. Um, use little amount of data to create a model and then you improve that over time. So there's a plethora of variations. Um, and so I, I don't know if this is the best solution. Uh, again, that depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, it is for me the most interesting one because it goes more towards this whole idea of how general learners can you create? How, how, how can you create most general learners that don't need to know anything and can get you to where you want to be, and how can we speed that up? So, if you talk to and and if you talk to other people in this field, and I'll show that in a second, there is some cool stuff coming up. But if you talk to other people, we will not agree probably that this is the best way to do it, um, and that's fine. This is science. This is about right. All the national labs, every almost every single one, LBNL, ORNL, NREL, PNNL, um, at least these four ones have. RL research going on right now. Um, some is building scale. Most of them are building scale. Some is on better simulation tools. Some is on implementing it on buildings. And so all of these little bits and pieces will help us understand what is best. Um, you know, somebody will say, like I mentioned before, um, our simulation show, you know, it's gonna be a year until we really improve the system. Somebody will stand up in a, in a presentation last time I gave this uh, and said, well, I'm not waiting a year uh, for this to work. I'm like, well, you already have a system running. So just start keeping that data. And then in a year, it will just magically switch over and it will be fine. So it's, it's you know, like that, that kind of stuff. We engineers are trained to optimize. And so 
so we want to have one system that's optimal quickly and so that that kind of mindset is sometimes often to i'm trying to challenge that a little bit um uh, well, then let me go ahead let me, let me uh, follow up on this this question mm -hmm. you just answered and when about model free and maybe get you to elaborate on some definitions like model free mm -hmm. and emergence uh, yep. These ideas. So, model free does it really mean there's no f in embedded physics into the yes. into the model, yes. right? So, there's no yes. knowledge about the physics of the world. But you are sensing things, or assuming things are being sensed within buildings. Uh, so, can you yes. say these are the things that are being sensed, and the your algorithms are essentially finding some relationship between what's being sensed right. and then what the environment is? Is that a fair statement? Yeah, so the, the, it, I would add to, so what the, what the algorithm does is it's find the relationship between what it senses and what it should do. And so, so that's basically the, the relationship. And, and you're correct. So there is no physical model behind it, uh, no physics. And so some people, like I said, do things like, well, here's a simple physics model, not a complicated one. And so let's try to use that as a start and improve that and see how that would work. And so that's that's at the idea of these hybrid models um, or, or hybrid RL systems where they have a little bit of both. Um, and uh, yeah, and on that, and you say maybe you could elaborate again on the rewards that you define. So if you're defining what success is by the reward in some sense, um, mm -hmm. you know, how does that relate to things that we normally think about? I think you mentioned, maybe, I don't know, energy or net energy. You had this. Yeah. 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 Algorithm. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, what are so, the so of the rewards and def defining them. Go ahead. Right. So your reward function, you know, that is this is what what you want your system to optimize, right? So you're providing it here as as a, as you know minimizing your your energy use. And so um, it, what you would think of this in your optimization problem would be your objective function that you're trying to minimize. Essentially, it's the same thing. So if you would set this up as an optimization problem, you would you know put in minimize energy use individually plus or multiply with uh, the sum of the energy use of the whole uh, microgrid. Um, and so th that's exactly the same same kind of like thinking uh, in that sense. How do you think about minimizing energy? Is this like energy over the whole year versus say a peak power, for example, or infrastructure investment, something like that? Yeah, no, that, I mean, that, not a problem. You can you can in integrate, as long as you have that information, you can integrate that here. So we, we've been in experimenting with, while we have not done it as a reward, we have been evaluating the agents on things like, you know, um, uh, uh, um, ramping or, uh, you know, load factors. And so to try to see like, what is what is it in terms of not just energy reduction per se, but also trying to, avoid like ramping behavior and you know avoid uh, generating more something that's more horizontal over time but but essentially anything you you're interested in you can put in as long as your model allows for that right okay so it's fair to say that that that's sort of areas of exploration within research and trying yeah. to understand you know the oh. definition of rewards and all absolutely this kind of yeah. Absolutely, and and you know what what we did in 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 the paper, um, and all this says unpublished, but we we have a publication now. But we did basically is look here are four different reward functions. Look what what the outcome is, and and with that you can shape what's coming out. And and of course for us it's more the energy and 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 stuff like that. But but you but you could make a difference. You could say energy use, so like you said, peak uh, versus the shape of your load. Like you could also parameterize your your actual daily profile and assign a reward for the more you know the more that is what you want like a more flatter profile for example right that would be something you would optimize for and that would be fine as well and you have a lot of options um, here so you're really not restricted and, and as with a lot of options it's sometimes not helpful because you, you have to design it and, and find them and try it out and do it all over again and so it's like we're taking steps towards this um, but it's it's kind of exciting to see it right like, what if you try this and what comes out of it? right <laughs> but this is the exciting thing this is why it's important to have the same environment because then everybody compares against that rather than building their own environment because it might depend a lot on the environment that you're testing it against and so 
if I do something and in my environment, this reward works well, maybe, you know, my colleague next door has a different environment, different buildings, different climate a little bit, different systems, and his rewards work differently. And so we don't learn anything out of that. So at least if we standardize a little bit, uh, we can understand individually what happens the easiest. I go a little bit to the question that's in the Q&A, if you can see yep. it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so in your presentation, you only showed one curve. Uh, can you generate an ensemble of solutions using the train agents because of the stochastic nature of the approach? Um, I assume this refers to this. So, so this is, um, so what we generate is your hourly profile for a year. And so what this changes over time a little bit, um, but, but it, then it will be depending on the simulation data for the, for the, for the weather. Um, and it will not, change much afterwards um, so but but in the beginning it does so the first year or two you have fought quite a wild generation and we we looked at those yeah we, we just haven't shown them here right so let me we don't have other other questions i'll ask my questions because yep. i'm quite interested in what you're saying so mm -hmm. in the idea of just thinking of sort of complex systems and i guess emergence or patterns that you might see that appear at sort of a macro scale without, perhaps without an understanding of what's going on at the micro scale, I guess that's kind of one type mm -hmm. of definition. Have you, have you kind of tried to plot these kinds of things or look at this, let's just say the energy usage versus the number of buildings uh, as the network expands or the, the shape of the network or any kind of configuration of yeah. the network? You know, things that occur in biology when you have sort of relationships that appear between energy consumption per se and the size yeah. of an animal. Yeah. So the short answer is no, we have not. Um, the the medium long answer is we're working on it. Um, as we, we have one, one project that is supported by the um, Energy Institute, uh, one of the FCT, uh, FSCT projects, um, fueling sustainable energy transition. And it, exactly the idea is... Um, you have a lot of these systems that, that connect. And so, and, and as things are not the same over time, so, you know, things evolve. So like I said, I mentioned we need, we're looking at five, six, seven years here for convergence, but if you do it on a, on a even on a neighborhood scale in 10 years, that neighborhood looks differently. And so, so you need to evolve the neighborhood with the system. So we're looking at a parametric model, how you evolve buildings in a neighborhood. So, you know, we upgrade, PV in the building. We upgrade, um, you know, single family homes to one multifamily home project. Uh, what is it called next? You know, that, that we, we're, we're deciding on. So it's very relevant to that. And so then we'll start seeing these interactions hopefully soon, like how many buildings do we, we need to upgrade to what extent so that we can generate an impact on the output of the whole neighborhood. And at what point do we get, you know, the, the sort of like diminishing returns? Like, is it 50% of the buildings, 20% of the buildings, 80% of the buildings. Uh, and, and that's a very interesting policy discussion then, because then the question will not be what sort of technology do we support or, or um, uh, you know, provide incentives for, but which one of the buildings or how many of the buildings in any given neighborhood would need the support so that combined we create a better environment or a better response for the grid. And that's, I'm not a, I don't understand policy, but but this will be a very interesting question. We, we did a study, and then I'll, I'll take out the other questions. In my in my Swiss times, um, uh, we, there was a study on a small little village that wanted to go net zero, and it was 800 buildings, and they completely you know categorized and looked at how the buildings would go and whatever, and they found you know the the usual 2080 rule, 20% 20 of the buildings would get you 80% to net zero, and 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 those were not all the same. Uh, uh, measures on every building. Some would need better windows. Some would need, some would profit from PV. Some would not. Some would need insulation. And so that those kind of questions, I think we have not started to explore yet at all. And so what we do here is add a layer of complexity to that. Say, well, what if these buildings now start interacting from an energy perspective, and that creates another layer of uh, up, um, uh, uh, opportunity to reduce our energy consumption and then flip our, uh, you know, emissions, um, and but also not only have complexity in terms of policy making. So I apologize right. to politicians I'll, already. I'll just make a comment and then you can go to these other questions okay. and I, I'll follow up with you later. But yeah, if, you, if you've done this, I don't know, plot the 
residential energy consumption versus the number of homes, which is kind of like looking at mm -hmm. the size of the system in some sense and its metabolism or energy. So it, it had changed in the 70s. So uh, energy energy consumption per home was going up until the 70s and then mm -hmm. going down afterwards. And so the post 70s is pretty much the same type of pattern as you would see in an animal growing or a mm. ant colony, mm. something like that. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. So yeah, go well, ahead. These other so, questions, if you like. Um, yep. So it seems you've designed City Learn to test our models on static demand. Uh, in the future integrations, we will allow custom building that can customize by target audience. Yes. So so you can you can actually create your own demand uh, buildings in there totally. Um, we have released with a set of buildings for the challenge, um, but but you can generate your own buildings for that. Um, like I said, and if you wanted to, um, to, to uh, and so and then the next step then would be to also allow for controlling thermostat set points, and so that's definitely where where this should be go or will be going. In fact, also as part of our FSET project, um, hopefully we can address um, moving thermostat points. But no, you can uh, add add buildings if you want to. Um, what do you think are the biggest possible obstacles to the next stage of RL? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's also a good transition to the, my next topic. Um, I don't know what the biggest challenges are, but one of the biggest one is what I started to mention uh, earlier is the robustness. How quickly can you learn without messing up your system? Uh, this exploration phase uh, to do it efficiently but without um, uh, you know, damaging your system. And then the second one is explainable um, RL or AI, where, where you, you integrate this into a, like a BMS, a building management system, and be able to create an integration or an interaction between the system itself and the building manager so that it becomes symbiotic and not a supervisory thing. So you, what you don't want is, you know, tell people, here's a system that's going to do everything for you. But what you want is here's a system that will assist you um, because you know a lot about your building and maybe that system does not and it needs to learn. But you two together can be like some kind of superpower, um, you know, super couple um, that, that is able to improve the building efficiently and, and much better. So I think that the integration with humans into this loop uh, and then the exploration with robustness are the two things that I think are, are challenging. Okay, so just to finish up, I think we're running out of time soon, but it's exciting. Um, so if you have questions, email me. But, you know, so we use it to learn in, in there is an RL class in the CS department. It's been used last fall. We had it in a summer school uh, in February in, in, uh, in Adelaide in Australia. People start using it, publish papers with it. The most exciting thing, uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, Mark, November 17th, in about a month, uh, we have a workshop at Biltsis, uh, Biltsis, which is the premier conference for smart buildings um, and, and, you know, civil engineering and, and uh, intelligent systems. It's an ACM, ACM conference. Um, so go to this website. Uh, there is a link to sign up onto an Eventbrite page so you get all the information. There is 12, in this workshop, there is 12 really cool uh, presentations. Um, like I said, LBNL, ORNL, PNNL, um, a couple of good schools, our school, of course, uh, Berkeley's and whatnot, um, Carnegie Mellon, a really cool um, uh, keynote by Zico Coulter from Carnegie Mellon, who talks about robust reinforcement learning. Um, so that will be also really interesting. So this is an afternoon. Um, it will be, oh, this might be, oh, it is 11, sorry, 11, not 20 yet. <laughs> Whoops, would have been a long one. No, 11 a.m. 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. Uh, or 12 to 4 Eastern time. That's the current status. So if you're interested, uh, come and sign up. Um, we'll probably also be recording it and releasing it later. But this is all your chance to participate or hear from everyone um, in, uh, in, in, in this field. Um, and then, you know, our work, um, I mentioned a lot about the speed buildings don't interact. We do have a paper right out now at, at Biltsis. Oh, yeah, yeah. So Biltsis, both Biltsis and the conference and the workshop are free, free to attend, which is pretty cool. Normally, this is like $200, $300, $400. So, you know, uh, it's right there. So our paper here is 
looking at this idea of interacting. So now we, we move away or we took a step closer to, well, if my neighbor does this and it tells me that, then what do I do? And then I tell my next person. And so there is this like iterative decision-making that's happening within the, the microgrid. So one step closer to complexity, but also a lot better in, in performance. So I invite you to come to that. This is at BuildSys. And then we also have a workshop paper uh, where we'll explore this, um, uh, the reward functions. And with that, we'll skip that, we'll skip that. We have a YouTube channel. Um, once it comes up here on the screen, go check it out. There's two defenses that both use RL in the built environment. Uh, June here uh, at the bottom, uh, zone level lighting control and thermostat control um, within a zone. And then Jose, uh, that's not on here. Jose Contelli, who just finished uh, in the summer, uh, who developed CityLearn, uh, his defense is also on there and you can learn uh, the details of that in a more technical way. And with that, thank you. I enjoyed this a lot. Thank you for the good questions. Um, and I'm happy to take more, if there are. Uh, right. Yeah, maybe we'll just close it there. So I thought it was very interesting and informative talk. Uh, so thank you very much, Zoltan Nagy, um, University of Texas at Austin, Department of uh, Civil and Architectural and Environmental Engineering. Thank you very much.